Welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America and the Caribbean, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program of hot news out of the region. In partnership with Friends of Latin America, Massachusetts Peace Action, and Task Force on the Americas, we broadcast weekly on Code Pink YouTube Live. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Telegram, and now on radindymedia.com. Today's episode is Ecuador erupts against neoliberalism with our guest, Escalante, uh, sorry, Camila, I'm saying Escalante, Camila, Camila Escalante of Casa Two News. Um, and you can follow um, Camila on Twitter and Casa Two News on Twitter, as well as find uh, Camila and her reporting at casachunews.com. And I will post those um, for all of you um, at the end of the program. So today we're going to talk about what's going on in Ecuador. And let me give all of you a little bit of uh, background. Thousands, thousands of indigenous demonstrators marched through Ecuador's capital on Monday, urging President Guillermo Lasso to agree to demands for economic and social support. The latest in a series of protests that have injured dozens, disrupted the economy, and witnessed uh, some pretty strong state repression. Amid a surge in, in the cost of living, the protest began last Monday with a list of 10 demands, including uh, those for a fuel price cut and um, preventing further expansion of Ecuador's um, oil and mining industry and more time for um, small and medium-sized farms to pay off debt. And that, um, we can talk a little bit more about debt uh, for small businesses as well as on the state level. Groups of indigenous protesters began arriving in Quito from across Ecuador late on Sunday to take part in a march from the south of the city, shouting out lasso out as other citizens cheered them on. A large anti-government march was also taking place in Guayaquil, Ecuador's largest city. At least 55 protesters have been injured and 79 have been arrested since protests began. The protest was called by the powerful, and I hope I say I'll say this correctly, Confederation of Indigenous Nationalities of Ecuador, CONAI, which is credited with helping topple three presidents between 1997 and 2005. So Camilla, we're so happy to have you here with us. And I'm so happy for our audience to have a chance to um, to talk with you and hear um, some of your reporting for the audience. Um, you should all know that Casa Chu News has been one of the first and one of the most prolific uh, news outlets reporting from Ecuador since Sunday night. Um, also, uh, Camila is joining us uh, from Sao Paulo, Brazil today. So she's had a chance to um, cover the housing protests taking place there. And uh, we can kind of link those two events. Uh, they're both uh, significant events protesting neoliberal forms of government and economics, and we're seeing that spread across the Americas since about 2019. So welcome, Camilla. So happy to have you here. And um, maybe you can share with us what, um, give the audience a little bit of background as to what has happened since Sunday night in Ecuador and the significance of it. Well, thank you so much for having me, Terry. Um, you know, there's just so, like you said, there's a lot going on in terms of uprisings against neoliberalism and, you know, against the, you know, permanent ongoing economic crisis throughout the region. People are really rejecting these sorts of anti-people, anti-working class, anti-poor policies, which, you know, really have affected people of the rural countryside in Ecuador. And, you know, in Brazil, it's everywhere from the rural area to, to the urban areas. The cost of living is just unbelievable. And it was already difficult in Ecuador when I lived there. I lived in Ecuador for four years and things were already very expensive. And that was given, you know, my situation where I had a, a, a wage that was a living wage. It was higher than the minimum wage uh, by a lot in, in Ecuador. Um, and, and so it's, it's really, uh, hard to imagine the sort of situation that people are going through now after having two subsequent uh, neoliberal um, governments, one right after the other, mm -hmm. and prices continue to rise. Um, people have lived through two 
you know, years of the sort of COVID situation, which, um, you know, since 2019, we've seen multiple states of ex exception decreed in Ecuador. We started with, you know, in 2019, this massive indigenous um, led uprising, which was a similar situation to what we're seeing now. And, you know, this was in response to the same sorts of things, but then we went from that to in 2020, um, you know, getting the, the COVID situation in, um, in Ecuador that came in March of 2020. And there was a very extreme situation that took place there because, um, you know, there, a lot of changes were made when, uh, when uh, the, the previous government of Lenin Moreno came into power. And a lot of people lost their jobs. We saw a lot of deaths in the streets. It was just a very extreme uh, situation there. But what happened was that we never saw an economic recovery. This mm -hmm. COVID situation is ongoing and their main tool to keep people at home um, has been this state of exception. And you know they have so many people in so many different sectors during this period have lost their job in education, in the healthcare sector. People lost their jobs in the healthcare system, in hospitals, doctors and nurses lost their jobs during COVID. It doesn't make any sense at all whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So this is what's, you know, this is what's being uh, protested now is the high unemployment rate, the, uh, you know, lack of uh, opportunities for young people, the lack of adequate um, employment. So many people are in precarious employment. They're not fully employed. Um, you know, people are, are working in very uh, sorts of irregular, um, you know, gig economy or employment with no privileges, no uh, pension or any sort of, you know, any sort of the benefits that were brought about under the citizens revolution of Rafael Correa, who governed for 10 years in which a lot of rights, you know, were, came about and people had, 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 had rights in the labor market. So that has all been stripped away since Lenin Moreno and now Guillermo Lasso. So just to bring people up to date now, we're on day 10 of this, of these national mobilizations, which are taking place in almost all of the provinces of Ecuador and all of the major cities, and also on major highways and roads mm -hmm. uh, throughout the country, where largely in those provinces and those rural areas and highways, uh, blockades have been set up by um, the indigenous movement, which is the main indigenous movement coalition, Konaye, like you said. Um, and there are also other uh, two other organizations uh, of indigenous peoples as well, who are not part of the Konaye, but who also um, have been alongside the leadership of that indigenous movement, giving press conferences, and they're all a part of that. And they have erected and maintained roadblocks all around the country for now 10 days. Um, and some of them have been consistent. And in addition to that, within the cities, uh, primarily within Ecuador, of course, which is the seat of government, there are massive protests which started, um, you know, being carried out by students, by unions, and other popular organizations and groups. Um, which includes, you know, feminists, includes some more um, anarchist type uh, tendencies and groups. It's a very mixed bag. But from, you know, the outside of Quito, from the different provinces and even in Pichincha itself, um, but outside of the city are where the indigenous communities come from. And they decided, they made the decision um, that they would start organizing delegations to send to Quito to protest. And we're seeing thousands of those people arrive every day for the last few days, but they haven't all been convoked, which means there's so many more people mm. who could potentially come down to Quito in the coming days or weeks. Um, and they're, you know, on reserve right now. These are, these are uh, you know, this is a very organized movement um, of, I guess hundreds of thousands of people and um, they're not in any way divided. It's a very cohesive movement as we saw in the October uprising of 2019 mm -hmm. and they're all prepared to get down to Quito. So what we saw this afternoon was thousands of people marching from the north of Quito 
towards the center where all of the mobilizations are taking place with Leonidas Iza, who is the president of the Konaye. He is the, uh, you know, he, he served as the leader and president of the Cotopaxi indigenous and campesino movement. And he was, you know, one of the main leaders during the uprising in October 2019 um, in his representation as the leader of the Cotopaxi movement. He then became the president of the Konaye um, last year, and he was the most the person who was most persecuted politically because of his leadership role in those 2019 protests. He does represent the left, uh, the mm -hmm. ideologically left movement um, within within the indigenous movement, and he has faced a little bit of you know persecution by the media because, uh, and even maybe within his own uh, ranks, because of his closeness to, uh, to the citizens revolution, I would say, uh, to, to simplify it a little bit. Um, and this is someone who is really bringing together the different sectors. He has called for a popular assembly of different forces so that it's not just indigenous people protesting mm -hmm. and mobilizing on their own apart, from all of the other sectors, because we're not only talking about unions, we're not only talking about students and teachers and health workers, we're also talking about entire sectors of people who might be uh, organized to one degree or another, whose industries have been absolutely shattered because of all of the different, uh, you know, geopolitical things going on, but even maybe things that began before that in the banana growing sector and other mm -hmm. uh, producers, rice, rice growers and all sorts of other industries um, are, are in a very bad position right now. And so those workers are also descending on Quito to, uh, to make their demands. So Konaya has their own list of 10 points or 10 demands that they, that they want to make. And you know, they want very uh, explicit answers from the government. And on the other hand, we see these other, these other sectors who have their own demands specific to the to the production that they need, what they need to be able to sustain their their work and their ways of living. We're talking about communities that survive, entire communities that survive off of milk or whatever it is that they that they produce and sell. So they're asking for things like price regulations, they're asking for things like gas subsidies um, and you know gas price freezes and so forth. And so there are a range, a wide range of people protesting right now with a very wide range of demands being being made right now. So it doesn't seem like it's going to stop anytime soon because there are no clear answers from the government so far on day 10 of the protests. So one, wow, I had no idea it was as wide reaching as it is, which is um, which is a really strong sign for the people for mobilization. I have a couple things that as I, I took a ton of notes as I'm listening to your talk. So I guess for um, I guess for our audience, let's um, when uh, Lenny Moreno succeeded Rafael Correa, he took uh, millions of dollars of IMF loans, which when, when a nation does that, when a government does that, um, austerity programs are required in response. My understanding is that um, there are there are state funds available uh, be, due to austerity, state things that uh, state institutions and organizations that have not been funded infrastructure. There are state funds available to perhaps meet some of the demands that the protesters are uh, are requesting. Uh, so the money is conceivably there. Uh, it's not there because of forced austerity, which is a you know is a repercussion of neoliberalism, the IMF loans, and that's a whole nother conversation. But just for our audience to have some background as to where this started. Um, also, you mentioned the bananas. My understanding is the banana industry, the exports from Ecuador, have been severely hindered uh, because of U.S. sanctions against Russia. Is that a tr is that a correct? Uh, relationship I'm I'm presuming there? Yes, I think um, the, you know, the, the banana sector was largely exporting overseas. And this is 
this has just been absolutely devastating. So they have no way of continuing that, um, you know, that trade. And um, this, this happened immediately. I think it was absolutely mm -hmm. devastated in, uh, in February. And so now we're talking about, now we've been in several months of this since June or from February until now June. And so, um, yeah, the, these people want immediate answers. I haven't followed up on that, uh, you know, the state of that recently, but, um, well, I, I know I have familiarity with the region of the, the banana growing region of, of Ecuador, which is kind of the, the coastal region to the south, which mm. kind of borders Peru, uh, particularly in the province of El Oro. And we're talking about massive part of the country that wholly relies on the production and sale of bananas. When you drive down the streets, all of the stores are fertilizers, are different inputs and implements and tools having to do with bananas. Everything has to do with bananas. We're talking about entire towns and cities. So when they say this has destroyed um, entire industries, it's just communities and towns where everybody, you know, everyone's personal and, and communitarian economy is absolutely tanked. And so, you know, this is the case for a lot of, um, you know, different industries. And it can be this, said this similarly for other parts of Latin America as well, mm -hmm. that are so yeah. dependent on one specific crop or the production of one specific, um, one specific product um, and, and, and the ways in which it's been devastated because of this conflict. I think this is really just as a side note, it's really important for, uh, the audience and a lot of a lot of you already do know this, but this practice of U.S. Uh, unilateral coercive measures, sanctions, is more commonly known as a form of um, diplomacy, is how the as how Washington likes to call it. It's actually, you know, for many of us, it's a form of warfare. How when one nation is targeted that nation and its people are not the only victims and it does ripple out and these u.s sanctions against russia it's profound how they've rippled out and as you said it, they're affecting you know a good part of latin america and i would say you know that's mm -hmm. one of the one of the many you know matches that have been thrown on this on this you know uh, pile of kindling wood in Ecuador that's been, you know, it's erupted once before, as you mentioned, in uh, 2019. And, and it's never been adequately resolved, even with the election of a new president last spring, April of last year. Right. And this is something that I think the, the, the governments of, for example, Nicaragua and uh, Bolivia have been preemptively trying to respond to by doing things like um, accelerating trade and relationships with, you know, countries that they had not previously had very close ties with or trying to reestablish these relationships um, and also, you know, buying and trading with uh, and selling with the neighbors rather than looking overseas. Instead mm -hmm. of us producing here in Latin America for export to the north, which is not, um, you know, nearly producing enough for themselves, um, you know, we have this we have this division where, you know, in which countries like Brazil, uh, where I am now, produce so much uh, for, for the global north, um, you know, countries like Bolivia are trying to, you know, organize relationships so that we have mutually beneficial trade within countries of the region, mm -hmm. like within the Andean community, within Mercosur, which Bolivia is now entering. And you know, having these talks within the spaces of Alba TCP and CELAC as well. Mm -hmm. So you know, the the mm -hmm. the what was able to, um, you know, the way in which the the economy has been set up in Ecuador has just been absolutely disastrous to say the least. So I just wanted to get back to because I was also taking notes for the things <laughs> that I was forgetting when I was speaking, and I just think, you know, we need to discuss the you know the way in which this. Um, the current protests in Ecuador has been um, framed by the interior minister and the mm. defense minister and the police, as well as, you know, the high level government authorities as terrorism. They're, they're calling the, the indigenous led uh, 
protests and demonstrations and mobilizations terrorism. They're saying that they're violent acts. They are, um, you know, using all sorts of anti-communist, anti-socialist slanders mm -hmm. to try to justify repression and the militarization of uh, the entire country, the militarization of the center of Quito, all of the area around the uh, presidential palace is completely uh, fenced off with, you know, metal fences. And those are all guarded by, you know, very dense lines, several people deep of police. And in addition to that, there are, you know, large areas of protest around um, the National Assembly, for example, which was another big site of protest in 2019, which now has both police and military presence. There's also a park called, called El Arbolito Park, which is in the center as well. It's basically just like two blocks from the National Assembly. And this has been a gathering space for indigenous peoples and social movements to protest on an ongoing basis for decades. However, it was of particular significance in, in 2019 and in earlier you know, protest movements and, and times of uprising. And in 2019, they used the indigenous, uh, the Conaye, uh, as well as some other you know, friendly movements used the Casa de la Cultura um, as a space of refuge for the indigenous people to sleep and eat and even bathe because these people come from other provinces. They literally have arrived on uh, trucks, um, some of them on foot with nothing on their backs. Literally, they just come you know, by themselves, maybe a purse or something, and they're having to, to sleep in a big, a big dome. This dome in 2019 was tear gassed by the police, asphyxiating the people inside. That was a crime then. They're also, they've also tear gassed now, um, you know, the, the uh, campuses of several universities, which have also begun to shelter indigenous people and protesters. Some of them are just, you know, university students that actually go there. And this has happened, um, you know, in different, uh, in different campuses of Ecuador. And so, you know, this has been taking place. We've heard some uh, rejection, some denouncements from some international uh, human rights organizations, and of course, from the human rights defenders within Ecuador. But on top of that, we have seen a lot of uh, detentions that it's very difficult to get mm -hmm. a consolidated number on how many people have been ar arbitrary, arbitrarily detained, arrested. Um, and uh, the leader of Conaya himself, Leonidas Iza, was himself arrested. So, <clears throat> um, you know, and then there's all of the injuries Injuries can come as a result of direct impact from, uh, for the most part, has been tear gas canisters. But we also see tramplings um, when police, you know, aggressively run at uh, demonstrations on horses, uh, mounted on horses. They also, you know, run people down on motorcycles um, and a number of other tactics. And so. Um, you know, the way in which the right wing media frames this has been that, you know, that the protesters are involved in vandalism and other sorts of crime, when that could not possibly be further from the truth. Isa, the leader of the indigenous movement, has almost every day, I believe, been calling on people to not provoke the police, not give the government authorities any sort of reason to be aggressive towards protesters, not to disturb any of you know, the, the property of either residents or, you know, public property of, um, you know, the city of Quito while they're there um, protesting. And they've also said the same for the protests going on in the capitals of all the other provinces and on the highways. So, you know, the, these sorts of attempts to frame the protests and the demonstrations as, you know, terrorist acts and acts of violence are completely fabricated but they have the mainstream media there, mm. the large networks working on side with the government, trying to you know, criminalize these people. And so it's a very dangerous situation because more and more every day, we're seeing them you know, try to justify the use of more brutal repression. And so we have seen two deaths, uh, the second being yesterday, two killings by, uh, by state forces and so I think we're going to see more of this because it doesn't seem like they're at a point 
where there's going to be any real dialogue between the different sides, being the government and you know the major, uh, at least Konaye or any of the major unions who are who are looking for looking for some uh, you know some relief from this economic crisis. You know, as I listen to you talk, it sounds so um, you know sounds familiar to the Paro Nacional in Colombia last year. And, um, you know, as you mentioned earlier, there was this first set of protests, national protests in Ecuador in 2019. And then that moved. Uh, we saw uh, protests begin in Chile on the heels of Ecuador. And then we have seen what's happened in Colombia. And now you're in Brazil and we're seeing uh, protests now against unaffordable housing and access to housing. This is all, I mean, I have to say, it's the the state repression and violence is terrible to hear. But also, we look at what some of this has led to in the rest of the hemisphere. And it is a fight. It is a fight for social justice, for economic justice, and for the end of these, this neoliberal model of capitalism that is violently enforced, not just by individual state governments and military, but by the United States military as well. There's, you know, the United States is 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 not innocent in, in any of this either, particularly with the issuance of, of, of loans. Is there, regarding the state violence, have there been any, um, any situations of uh, police shooting at uh, protesters' eyes, as we've seen in the past, and particularly in Colombia last year, but also uh, I think we started seeing that in Chile in 2019 as a practice. Yeah, we, we saw that we, we saw that in, in Ecuador as well, and you know there were some higher profile cases of that as well, where you know people went to the press, you know, in the period since that violent repression, there were 11 killings in 2019. And there were just countless injuries as well. And for those protests of 2019, the interior minister of, um, of Lenin Moreno is currently, you know, being sought. She escaped to uh, the United States to start teaching as a university professor. Uh, actually, before Lenin Moreno's uh, term even ended, she just wanted to get out of there because um, she was censured by the National Assembly. And currently there are, you know, members of the Citizens Revolution who want to hold her accountable back in Ecuador for the crimes she committed. It wasn't uh, not only the repression, but, you know, she also, uh, a number of, you know, audios and chats were released saying that she was uh, involved in other sorts of corruption. But so people still haven't forgotten about, you know, the, the heavy use of force during those, but it's continuing, um, it's continuing now. I just wanted to read some of the, um, or summarize some of the actual concrete points set out by Konaye, because I do think, um, not, not to compare one process to another, but I do think that in Ecuador, the, you know, some of the points made by this major movement that is leading a lot of the protests are so much more concrete and clear um, due to its current leadership but as well as, you know, due to um, this organization being permanent, it's not just spontaneous, um, you know, it's not just a bunch of different forces, although there's a multitude and a, a broad range of, of organizations that are participating in this, it's mostly being led by this one um, organization of different indigenous, you know, nationalities. And so they have been very um, clear because they have been making these uh, demands for the last um, the couple, last couple of months, but they actually started making these demands in 2021. And so they, they have been very clear about the, the 10 points that they want to see responded to by um, Guillermo Lasso's government. So they're asking for a fuel price reduction and freeze and no more fuel price hikes. They're asking for subsidies for sectors which need it most, such as peasants and the transport sector and fishing. They're asking for economic relief for, uh, for you know, families who might face eviction and who have debts on their homes. Um, and you know, they're saying no to the seizure of assets such as houses, lands, and vehicles for non-payment. Because of course, 
all of this became necessary that these emergency uh, measures be taken to, to prevent people from being thrown out on the streets during COVID. But none of the, you know, the, the, the economy hasn't been, hasn't been in any way uh, restored or normalized or anything like that. People continue to, to really struggle right now with multiple unemployed people in a household. So they're saying no to, no to you know, seizure of assets and evictions. They want fair prices for farm products like milk, rice, bananas, onion, fertilizers, potatoes, corn, and much more. Also, Ecuador is a is a very um, important uh, country for the production of flowers. I don't know if people mm. know that, but everyone's roses in the U.S. and everywhere else come from Ecuador. So you know those people have their own have their own demands. Um, they want um, you know they they want to go back to the period of the citizens' revolution. Uh, well, they don't word it, but that's how I word it. Of of the employment and labor rights that began to exist during that period um, due to the, you know, the precariousness that we see now where there's so many people working very precariously um, and, and, and not, um, you know, not so for, formal jobs. People are working more and more in the informal sector. Um, you know, they also want, um, an, they want to stop the privatization mm -hmm. of strategic sectors of Ecuador, which they say belong to the Ecuadorian people. So those are, you know, the banks, hydroelectric plants, um, the telecommunications of, of the state, um, the highways, health, and many others, and the social security system, obviously. And they also want an end to speculation and abusive pricing um, and um, by intermediaries of, of stable products. Um, let me see, health and education, um, there's a huge shortage in the hospitals of um, not only budget, but medicine, but also different uh, things that you need. Now, if you go to a public hospital in Ecuador, I mean, this is just so mind boggling. But, you know, I've been told by, by my, my comrades and colleagues who, who still live there, if you need a surgery, you have to go and buy your own anesthetic, your own, um, what is it called, stitches. I mean, you basically you have to show up with it or pay for it. It's just like, un it's just an unbelievable failure of a public system. And one of the most- Well, it's almost, it's the complete dismantling of the public system, infrastructure, exactly. organ institutions, yeah. And then the last thing I just wanted to say, this is just so un important and unbelievable, um, is the massacres that are taking place in the prisons, the, the, mm. the, the, the hold on Ecuador that the cart international cartels have right now, where there are executions in the street, there are, you know, paid for hire killings, you know, mercenary attacks, um, just an unbelievable rise, sharp, staggering rise in violent crime um, and, and, and murders across the country, which all began, you know, during the presidency of Lenin Moreno and has only risen now under mm -hmm. uh, Guillermo Lasso. It is uh, just unbelievably difficult situation of insecurity where people in multiple parts of the country, largely in Guayas, in Guayaquil, in Esmeraldas, on the border with Colombia, and of course in Quito, are afraid to go outside, they live in fear. Um, it's scary to go to the bank to carry money on you to go stand at the ATM. It's a very different situation from what people are used to living in in Ecuador. It wasn't like that for a long time. It was actually one of the safest parts mm -hmm. of South America. And that, that changed in a very short period of time. And now Ecuador feels like what people have become used to and normalized in Colombia or Honduras. Yeah. So this is, this is something that people are making demands that you know that something be done about this this has to do with you know the way in which the um you know the 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 institutions that uh, oversaw the prison system before were folded into other you know other parts mm. of government and you know just the collapse of those sorts of of that sort of um of key institutions uh that kept the you know the prison system running adequately during the Korea years so this is this is something that people are very desperate about. 
um, is you know, how, how is it that we're having prison escapes every weekend where there's just, you know, people also in the, these massacres that have taken place in the, in the prisons, a lot of the people who were killed were not actually members of the gangs that were involved. It was just, you know, for no other way of saying it, you know, innocent bystanders who were being kept in those penitentiaries who ended up being decapitated. So it's very grueling what's going on. You've been, Casa Chu News has been one of, one of the few and really out front in covering uh, these, these, these murders occurring in the, in the prisons in Ecuador. And I would encourage the audience to take a look at casachunews.com and also your Twitter account to follow that story. You've been one of the very few to really highlight that. And I, I would also argue, you mentioned, you know, Colombia and Honduras, this, you know, when this kind of vice comes into a country through the cartels, drug trafficking, gambling, prostitution, it goes hand, it, 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 goes hand in hand with austerity. And this was also a big, this is a big reason the Colombians uh, want to change in their government. It's a reason why the Hondurans voted for change last November. And I would also argue it's a big reason for the Cuban revolution in, you know, in 1959 was to get in those days with the cartels were called the mafia and to get, you know, all the vice trade off the island. So they go hand in hand with the privatization and the austerity. And it's just really, it's very horrifying. I wonder before I let you go, since you mentioned one, you know, one of the 10 demands is to, um, is to help uh, indigenous social movements, agricultural workers to, uh, you know, to give some, some state help to avoid um, having um, home loans defaulted on and transportation and, and probably also, um, agricultural equipment. I mean, once those things are taken from you, you can't make, you can't, how do you make a living? Then there's no hope at all to repay the loans. So regarding the housing issue, you're in, in Brazil. Can you quickly give us an update on, on what you're reporting on uh, from there? And then, and then I know you've got a really incredibly busy schedule, so we'll let you go. Yeah, so it, here, in, here in Brazil, um, you know, we're moving towards the end of Bolsonaro, Jair Bolsonaro's presidency, and people can really feel it. I think we're going to see, you know, from this, during this stretch of time between now and October, 12, October 2nd, when the presidential elections are going to be held, we're just going to see a lot of protests. People are just at their actual limit. And so the protests, which we were covering uh, yesterday, and we hope to get some more um, exclusive interviews, uh, you know, translated and subtitled because we've already done them and, you know, it takes a bit of time. But um, what happened was, you know, during the, the beginning of, of COVID, um, the Congress was able to pass a law um, against evictions, making evictions illegal. And this was really important because so many people in a very short period of time lost their jobs, had to work from home, more people moved into a more precarious sector, um, you know, began working in these irregular jobs outside of the formal employment sector and had, you know, fewer rights and they were just simply not able to pay their rent. And this uh, law was, um, it was renewed, it was extended a couple of times, and it will now expire on June 30th at the end of the month. And so, you know, when this takes place, hundreds of thousands of people, um, and obviously one of the largest uh, countries in the world. This is a massive country, but hundreds of thousands will immediately face eviction. And that is just in the weeks after this, you know, takes place. Um, and, you know, after the protections are lifted in the coming months, it could be millions um, of, of families facing eviction. And so in no way has the economy recovered since COVID, you know, in fact, on the contrary, I'm, you know, I'm not sure where we are in terms of if there's going to be another wave or not, but economically, things have not, have not improved in any way. So people here face, um, you know, the, the poorest of the poor face issues with housing, but also this is a country that has, you know, where hunger has spiked in, you know, under this presidency and since Temer, uh, Michelle Temer, who took power in the, in the coup in 2016. So, it, you know, the under Lula, 
uh, Brazil was taken off the UN hunger map. It was a country that was no longer considered to be among the hungry, um, you know, and now it's back on the map. So, um, so that's what people have been protesting. There are a lot of very large um, and historical movements here who have fought for the rights to housing and against evictions. Um, and, you know, these are kind of the, the social movements that are hosting me um, while I'm here. And I've had um, the, the opportunity to, to interview some of these, um, the, the leaders of these movements and also people, residents who are residing in, you know, occupations or otherwise, you know, seen or known as squats where there are just so many buildings here. I mean, this is no different from North America or anywhere else, but that have no social purpose. I mean, that, that's how they say it in, in Portuguese. These are buildings that were either supposed to be some sort of faculty of a university or there were office buildings or condominiums and nobody lives in them. Meanwhile, there, the streets are flooded with homeless people everywhere in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. Anyone who has been here knows that Brazil is what other people think socialist countries are like. You know, when people put out these ideas about poverty and hunger and, and they try to, you know, you know, attribute these, these different things to living under socialism or communism, that's actually how Brazil has been since Michel Temer and now under Jair, Jair Bolsonaro. It's just very um, shocking visually to see so many people living under a highway underpass, a freeway underpass, or a bridge um, in, in cold, damp, you know, areas under roads. Um, just, just long, long, long stretches, as anyone knows who knows Sao Paulo. It's very large in size. And the homeless population here and in Rio is massive. Of course, there's other people who live in favelas where you know the type of homes and structures they live in are very much inadequate to say the least among other problems such as the repression and you know the heavy use of force by the security forces in these areas where the poor live and you know the state has militarized and they literally go and kill people um, with no regard for human life and it's not even covered in the media so the situation here is just so extreme and what people are saying I mean, regardless of what the what the campaigns say on social media or what people say in the US, people here on the ground since 2016 have been telling me, because I was here in 2016, that they want to see the PT, the Workers' Party, and Lula da Silva come back to power. Mm. And he was prevented from running in a scheme of lawfare um, when he was arrested and jailed just before, you know, in the months before the last election. And he was leading in the polls and they jailed him on false charges. And so another candidate uh, ran on behalf of the Workers' Party. And of course it was you know, a lesser known, less popular figure. So now people here see this as an opportunity to get the Workers' Party back in power. And Lula has the endorsements of the PASOL and many other liberal and progressive sectors, not just the, not just the leftists, but more centrist uh, sectors as well, and of all of the social movements. And these are some very large social movements, namely the landless workers movement, the you know movements for housing, and other other progressive and urban movements as well. And so it seems you know it, it seems certain that he will, if no um, you know major attempt is made um, at some sort of a you know coup, um, that he should make it back to the presidency come this come this October and they can begin the process of restoring um, you know, some of the, the progress that was made during his previous presidency and, and start working on, on, on fixing the economy here um, you know, for one of the most staggering and unequal um, and impoverished countries of our, of our continent. Wow, well, we'll look forward to your reporting on October 2nd, <laughs> Rob. And, uh, <laughs> It's, um, I mean, for our audience, I think, you know, we've talked about, you know, an underlying theme of almost every episode of this program is neoliberalism and, and how it's exported by the United States throughout the hemisphere. And to just see every country that 
austerity is introduced, the privatization. So the austerity comes from taking these IMF loans, which requires the privatization of public organizations, institutions, and infrastructure, sets in austerity. And what happens? The result is catastrophic for average people. And, and then on top of that, the, the Global South has suffered austerity prod, you know, programs um, in conjunction with COVID since uh, March of 2020. So it's just devastating. And I'm, I'm so thankful that you're there you know, to cover these issues and to share them with you. And so I want to remind our audience that you can find um, Camilla Escalante on Twitter. You're at Camilla, Camilla Press on Twitter and Casa Tune News on Twitter as well, just as it, as it sounds, Casa Tune, uh, K-A-W-S-A-C-H-U-N-N-E-W-S. And you can also uh, be sure to check out their website, casatunenews.com on the net. So everyone, you've been watching What the F is Going On in Latin America and the Caribbean, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program of hot news um, out of the region. You can watch us every week on Code Pink YouTube Live, as well as catch us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Telegram, and now RadIndieMedia.com. Um, also be sure to catch Code Pink Radio every Wednesday on WBAI out of New York City, WPFW out of Washington, D.C., 11 a.m. Eastern. And um, again, thank you so much, Camilla. Really wonderful to have this conversation with you. And thank you so much for sharing with us uh, what's happening in Ecuador and now Brazil. And we will um, we'll see what changes come down the road. We've seen change in, in Colombia last Sunday, the 19th. So we will we will look for more of your news and hope and and uh, and and watch as all of this unfolds. So thank, thank you, you so everyone. Much, oh, thank you. We'll have you back. These stories deserve some great follow-up. So, so everyone watching and listening, we'll we'll see you next week. <laughs>